It's a mailbag episode of Locked On Blazers. We got questions about who's going to get the 14th roster spot, Amphrey Simon's development, and which blazer is which food item. Welcome to Locked On Blazers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Trailblazers, your daily Portland Trailblazers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, world? It's your past first point guard and Trailblazers reporter, Mike Richmond. You're listening to another episode of Locked On Blazers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. Listen, we're, we're pushing for 1,000 YouTube subscribers by Halloween. We're up over the 500 mark. We're pushing towards 600. Don't wait around. Go ahead and subscribe. If you're listening to the show and you're a podcast listener, do me a favor and, and subscribe to it on another platform. It helps grow the show, helps make the show more visible, and I would really appreciate it. A thousand subscribers by Halloween, we can get there, but we need your help. So if you haven't subscribed yet, do it and then tell your friends to do the same. Today's episode is an edition of so special delivery, special delivery edition of Mailbag Monday coming to you on a Wednesday. Uh, so we do this every week. Typically, I record on Mondays and post it on Tuesdays. Hence, it's a Mailbag Monday. But this week is special delivery episode uh, because of the way the Blazers' uh, preseason schedule worked. But every week, we do a Mailbag episode answering listener submitted questions all episode long. If you want to get involved, there's two ways to do it. You can email the show, lockedonblazerspod at gmail.com. That's the simplest way to do it. Or you can tweet at me, at Mike G. Rich on Twitter is my my handle. Uh, send me a tweet whenever you're thinking of it. it. helps if you tag it as Mailbag Monday. That way I'll see it. Um, and I know it's a question for the show and not just kind of like a query on the internet. Or you can wait for, uh, just watch my Twitter feed and I will send out a tweet soliciting questions. Usually I do it on Mondays. Uh, this week the, the, the schedule is a little bit different. So I did it on a Tuesday morning, but watch my Twitter handle, follow me on there. And you, you respond to that tweet. I'll do my best to get you in the show. Those are the two ways to do it. Like I said, we do this every week. And neither snow, nor heat, nor rain, nor gloom of night stays mailbag for your ears. So let's get into it. Our very first question comes from Eli, who asks, as far as the 14th roster spot is concerned, my vote would go to Dennis Smith Jr. Woo! It's literally, this is in Eli's question. I'm reading it word for word. Imagine a lineup of Robert Covington, Damian Lord, Dennis Smith Jr., Norman Powell, and a big on-ball defender who can facilitate. Woo! In all seriousness, as constructed, who's your 14th man? So I I don't even understand the excitement over that lineup. I think that's like a, a low-key bad Blazers lineup, but I'm going to let you cook, Eli. Um, I talked about this a bunch on uh, yesterday's show, so if you missed your fee- if you missed that one, go back and listen to it. We talked all about Dennis Smith Jr. He had played really, really, really well in the Blazers' second preseason game. We do this every day. If you listen every day, you'll get more news. That's how it'll work. But um, I think if you're just picking – best player, Dennis Smith Jr. by a mile. But for me, I think front court depth is a really, really big problem for this roster. Um, they just don't have a lot of tall dudes. So I, I think it would still be Marquise Chris because of, of the four, um, of the four guys who are competing for that spot. It's uh, I think he's the the best big, I think he's better than Patrick Patterson. Um, but I, but like it's, it, he's not better than Dennis Smith Jr. Like in a vacuum, like Dennis Smith Jr. is like a more talented basketball player. But for this roster, I think it's Marquise Chris. PDF Paranormal MSW, that's Master of Social Work, at Bob underscore Deager on Twitter asks, well, it's safe to assume Pat Pat, that's Patrick Patterson to Pat, is Neil and Chauncey's guy for the 14th roster spot. I don't know about Neil. Seems like he's definitely Chauncey's um, and uh, whatever. Uh PD continues, I'm still curious if we have any sort of dibs on D- Dennis Smith Jr. Can he sign with whoever presents him the best option or would the Blazers have to release him first? Yeah, he's on a training camp deal. It's like a non, non-guaranteed non contract, but he's under team control until um, until training camp ends. So uh, they will get to make a decision on the final day of the preseason, um, like Friday evening, basically. And uh, then it will be... Um, then the Blazers will then Dennis Smith Jr. If he doesn't sign, will be free to um will be free to sign wherever. But yeah, they've they've got dibs. That's how that works. Next question comes from Dr. J, who asks, I think for the first time, post Lamarcus Aldridge, we, that's two collective pronouns in the first two, three questions. Love to see it. If you're a new listener, I love a collective pronoun. I'm always calling them out. We 
have a third player capable of scoring 20 plus points in Norman Powell. In the past, we have rarely had Damon CJ rest at the same time, but if Chauncey wants to reduce their minutes, I think this is more likely than not something which will have to happen this year. So my two related questions are one, assuming that Amphrey Simons will be the back court running mate, what would be the ideal group in the front court of to balance both the offense and D if Norm is your number one option for a few minutes each half? Uh, I, I think... You know, I think it would probably be Larry Nance Jr. and Nurk. I think that's your best uh, offense-defense pairing. I also think those are um, to like pair with um, to pair with the second unit. I think that would be like keeping Nurk on that second unit and not having because Nurk's just like a more skilled offensive player than Cody Zeller, and it gives it gives a little more punch and it allows for um, Norm and Nurk to be sort of your featured guys with Ant Ant kind of getting in where he fits in, and then sort of Larry Nansen is your little or Larry Nansen a shooter like Ben McLemore and Tony Snell kind of fitting in. I think that's that makes to me that's the best. If you want to sit Damon CJ at the time, I think you've got to. It would make more sense to me to keep Nurk on the floor, but that even, even that doing that, it makes the rotation a little bit dicey because you have to take out Nurk early and then bring him back. Next question from Dr. J. This is a two-parter. What is your prediction on the number of Dame and CJ list minutes that we see each night? So we ha- we didn't see it in their first game. Um, and and uh, CJ is listed as probable for the Blazers' third preseason game this uh, Wednesday afternoon in Phoenix. So hopefully we'll see it then. Uh, Chauncey Phillips talked about not staggering Dame and CJ. And then the very first game, he immediately staggered Dame and CJ. So um, we'll see how it works. I understand the sort of crutch of having one of those two players on the court all the time because you just want your good players on the court. I totally understand it from uh, from Phillips's perspective, for sure. Uh, and we'll see how it plays out. But I'm going to guess four. I'm going to guess four. Um, really limited. I just don't – I don't – I. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's maybe it's eight for each half, but um, I I don't I just don't think we're going to see it that much. So on average, I'll say four. Next question comes from David, who asks, "I buy the importance of Ant becoming the Blazers' true backup point guard this year. How the front office coach, how the front office and coaching staff have created that space for him, and how it is his stated goal to become that. But who in the NBA really does that well now? Are there any good backup PGs in the league right now? There are. I can't think of any, but I don't follow other teams very closely as I." know you do so i'm interested in your opinion part two of the question what do you think was the last true backup pg the blazers had in frazier steve blake shabazz napier i mean it was shabazz napier for sure um he's not like a pass first point guard but yeah he was the for sure the most recent sort of true true point guard because that's what baz is he's a scorer but that's that's a point guard score in the nba now it's how it works i mean Monte Morris is is one of the best backup point guards in the league. Uh, Derek Rose is one of the best backup point guards in the league. Like, um, it's it's not that crazy uncommon. I mean, even um, you could throw in like a guy like Playoff Rondo, but I'm not a believer. But like on the Clippers last year, that was kind of his function was to be was to be that backup point guard. I think some other other guys that have to be considered like really good backup point guards. Jalen Brunson's pretty good. TJ McConnell um, is 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 also deserves to be be up there. He's he's a really good backup to in Indiana for Malcolm Brogdon. I mean, plenty of teams have it. <laughs> it's not. I don't think it's that uncommon, David. Next question is from Blue, who asks, "My question is simple. What do you think? Who do you think is more valuable player, CJ McCollum or De'Aaron Fox?" You know, these player rating stuff, the question is simple. Like the words are simple. There's not many words. There's not many words in that question. And it's like straightforward. I understand what the question is, but player rating stuff is not simple. I would argue it's not a simple thing. Um, it's just not like, it's, it's hard to say. Like I, I would lean CJ McCollum, it, you know, Darren Fox averaged something like 25 and seven um, without looking up last year, but I believe that's, that's right in the range, 25 and seven. He's, he's incredibly good. He's one of my favorite players to watch in the league. Um, I really, really like him, but like, um, I think the, the ability to create shots off the dribble is, is incredibly valuable. And CJ's and Darren Fox is not a good shooter. He can't dribble into jumpers very well. And CJ can. And I think as a guard, that's a more valuable skill. Uh, I think CJ took enough of a step forward that he's, you know, close the gap a little bit in terms of playmaking, but it's, I, like it depends on what you want. Um, they're just they're different players. Um, I would lean CJ McCollum, but I think it's close. Um, CJ would be, you know, in the way that some people say, like CJ could lead his own team. I don't think he could. I don't think he's that good. But he could lead a bad he could lead a bad team like the, like the Kings. Like if you want to have like a team that doesn't make the playoffs, you have CJ as your best player. All right. That is, we're going to come back in a second, second and answer more of your questions uh, on this glorious mailbag Monday. But first, let's talk about Sweat Block. 
I want to tell you about Sweatblock wipes first and foremost. Sweatblock makes a variety of of, of products, including uh, including deodorant. But Sweatblock wipes, what I want to tell you about, they are doctor created, doctor recommended, and they work for up to seven days per use. They're so simple to use. Here's what you do. Before you're going to bed, you take a sweat block wipe and wipe it where you're going to sweat, on your underarms or wherever you're going to be uh, perspiring. If you're a heavy perspirer, you, you, you know what the deal is. You wipe it where you're, you're going to sweat, you go to bed, you wake up, you take a shower, you go about your day with confidence that you're going to be dry all day. You wear what you want because perspiration is not going to be a problem. Sweatblox is very confident in their product. In fact, they give you the dry shirt guarantee. If Sweatblock doesn't keep you dry, you get your money back. It's as simple as that. But you don't have to trust me. You don't have to trust me, um, you know, <laughs> telling, you, uh, telling you about this product. You can go to Amazon.com right now where Sweatblock is currently the number one product in the antiperspirant category on that website. Plus, it's been one of the best sellers on Amazon for the last decade, and there's over 13,000 reviews. There are real people out there, literally thousands of them who use Sweatblock and can tell you what they think about it. So if you don't have to trust me, you can do your own research, as they say. But if this sounds like something you need or someone you know, someone you love had deals with sweating and heavy perspiration, why don't you... Uh, why, why don't you make, try Sweatblock out? Go to sweatblock.com. Use the promo code Locked On. You'll get twenty percent off. This product is also available at Amazon and at your local CVS for those of you who like to shop in person. All right, let's keep it rolling on this glorious mailbag Monday. Our next question comes from Scott, who asks. Assuming we, that's our third collective pronoun, thank you, Scott. Assuming we keep CJ, what is the best closing lineup around Dennis Smith Jr., Greg Brown, and Dame? <laughs> uh, but seriously, in the fourth quarter of the second round of the playoff series versus the Lakers, Phoenix, or Utah, who closes? This is fascinating to me, and I think the answer might be different for different teams. Um, you know, all those teams have big guys. All those teams are big, right? Um, DeAndre Ayton and Rudy Gobert are probably going to be on the floor at crunch time, so you got to play big with... with uh, uh, Yusuf Nurkic, but against the Lakers, uh, Yusuf Nurkic has been a pretty bad, like Anthony Davis has given Nurk fits. So maybe you scale down and maybe you go with Larry Nance Jr. But even without like delving into the specifics of a pl second round playoff matchup on October 12th, Scott, thank you for letting me get out over my skis. But um, I think one of the fascinating parts about this team is who closes? Does Nurk close games? Does Nurk stay on the floor and finish games? Or do the Blazers scale down and play Larry Nance Jr., who's capable in small doses to play center and the is certainly the right matchups? You're not going to play him against, you know, Joel Embiid or whatever. But like, do you play Nance? Like, do you do you go in that direction? I think it's fascinating. I don't know. I don't have a good feel on it. I had a really good feel on what Terry Stotts would do after being around him for six, seven years. I don't know with Chauncey. And I think it's one of the fascinating sort of developments for this season is um, how, how much does, who's on the floor when you've got a tight game with six minutes left and is it, does it, how much does it change on matchup or is it, these are our five, we're going to, you know, live or die with them. I think it's, it'll be a fascinating study in sort of how Billups approaches coaching. I'm, I'm, I'm super, super curious to, uh, to learn more about how he approaches it. Next question comes from Blake Pitaro at Ball Don't Lie 77, who asks, with all the talk of Zion's unhappiness with the Pels, would you ever consider a Dame for Zion Williamson trade? Maybe Zion plus pieces for Dame since Zion's health longevity is a question mark. If both Blazers and Pels struggle early this season, I would do this at the deadline. I think this is a misread on Zion Williamson's trade value. Um, the dude, obviously, he's going to miss the start of the season, and his his health is a big question mark. But he's like freaky deaky Shack. Like he's so so good. Um, I don't know if we're like. I don't mean to. I'm not like coming after you, Blake. Like watch Zion or whatever. But like he's uh, like a he's a historically special offensive talent. He is so, so good and he's young. And if you trade for him, he's under team control. Like he'll be a restricted free agent. Um, he could, you know, you could keep him for uh, another seven seasons, uh, assuming you count this one. But like it, it's, Dame doesn't have that trade value like that. Like I understand the logic of the swap is like the Pelicans get this all NBA type guy who immediately propels them to like, the level that the Blazers are at, but maybe a little bit worse because the roster's not as good. Um, 
And the Blazers start over with this generational young talent. But like, I think the generational young talent, like you're always trading. Most teams are trading for upside. Um, and if you're trading Zion Williamson, if the, if they're, if the Pels are trading Zion Williamson, it's because he sort of like demanded out and they're going to start over probably, or they're going to make like, multiple trades and they're trading for like Damian Lillard and Paul George or whatever it is. Um, I guess Kyrie <laughs> would be the other one. Um, like, some you know, Ben Simmons. So it's uh yeah, I don't I don't think it would be Zion plus pieces. It's I I would, you know, if you're the Blazers and and like um and and they stink and you realize Dame's gonna leave and you can get Zion Williamson, you do it in a heartbeat. You do like um, you know, you you sprint you sprint to the phone to get on the call with the league office as soon as it's accepted. Um it's that seems really unrealistic, though. That seems wild. That seems just like a misread on what Zion Williamson would command on the open market. Um, it it would be Dame plus stuff, I think. Next question comes from James Daniel, who asks, I'm a lifelong Blazers fan from the Pacific Northwest, transplanted to Washington, D.C. Being in the area, there's plenty of talk about where Ben Simmons ends up. <laughs> D.C. and Philly aren't that cl- I mean, they're close, but it ain't like that. <laughs> That's like, no, I'm just kidding. I mean... I got, listen, I got East Coast friends. My friend Chuck, also my sister, uh, live, uh, former, my sister, current DC resident, my, my friend Chuck, long-term DC resident. Philly's close, but it's not like, it's not like, um, it's not like that. In any, in any case, that's just a little, ge- that's a little geography gripe, James Daniel. But I will say this, that people probably care more about the Sixers than the Wizards in, in, in the district. Continuing on, I got sidetracked on this question that I was reading to myself. Continuing on, CJ's CJ McCollum's a great guy, but over time I found myself pessimistic that him and Dame can coexist on the same championship team as a first and second options due to their defensive struggles. Ben Simmons feels like an upgrade to me, even if he doesn't shoot. Do you think a CJ for trade Ben works in our favor? CJ for Ben trade works in our favor. Yes, I've said it a thousand times. Yes, 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 yes. I'm in favor of it. And what does the situation look like? So basically, James Daniel wants to know like, when Dame needs the ball and Ben Simmons needs the ball, how does it work? I don't know. I mean, like, I, I think you you utilize Dame more off the ball. He's like, tr- they're experimenting with it with Anthony Simons. If he can do it next to Anthony Simons, he can certainly do it next to one of the best passers in the league, um, an elite open court threat. Like, it's not, that shit is not a concern to me. I, I am, the one ball thing with Simmons, I'm a big believer in him, man. I'm a big, big, big believer. Um, I just... I'm just not I'm just not worried about like oh but he needs to be on the ball. Um he's flawed and weird and he'd be a weird pairing pairing with Nurk and he's um and he seems I haven't really met anyone who's been spent time around Ben Simmons and like <laughs> vouches for him. Anyone I've talked to around Philly doesn't care for him. That's probably like the way he's handled himself and stuff like that. But like it's um I I'm a believer in talent. I'm not worried about the Dame Ben Simmons fit. And that wouldn't even matter because the Dame CJ fit is relatively similar, except CJ shoots a bunch of threes now and always has shot a bunch of jumpers, but uh, I'm not worried. Next question comes from Jacob Gian Hawthorne, who asks, what opposing teams are you most looking forward to see play this year? Are there specific player matchups you're interested in or any rival teams with seeding implications? I think it's a, <laughs> it's a little early for seeding implications, but there is like a group of teams that I think the Blazers are relatively similar to. And um, I am curious what that looks like. Uh, I, think they're, I think the Blazers are really similar to the Mavs. I think they're really similar to the Warriors. And I think they're really similar to the Clippers without Kawhi Leonard. I think all, all four of those teams are kind of right in that sort of bunch. And um, I would throw Denver in there too. Denver pre-Jamal Murray probably in there too. But I think the other three teams, I kind of think Denver's better because I'm a believer in Jokic. But um like the are, how much better are the Mavs than the Blazers? I think they're maybe better, but like maybe not. Certainly, certainly they're a team that um, you know they also had injuries last year and they made sort of minor upgrades to get better, but no major swing. Um, and they're they're still kind of this you know Luca plus other parts, and we're hoping that Chris Stapps works out. Like they're in a similar spot to the Blazers, and that they had literally identical records last season. You know the words look good, uh, but uh, and their and their their depth is way better than it was last year. But I think they're kind of before Clay gets back, kind of on the same level. Same with the Clippers. So I'm fascinated by that group. Um, kind of where the Blazers stack up with those three teams is really fascinating to me. Uh, other teams I'm just like excited to watch. I'm really excited to see what this year's Bulls team looks like with uh, with Lonzo and DeMar DeRozan and, and Zach Levine now with like better help and, and a full year of Vucevic. Like that team stunk down the stretch, but uh, I kind of think 
I'm, I'm curious to see where they are. They could be um, out of the playoff team or they could be a team right in the thick of it. Really excited to see the Hornets this year. Really, really fun team. I really like PJ Washington. I really enjoy Miles Bridges' ferocious dunks. And LaMelo Ball is worth watching every single chance you get because he is one of the most creative passers to like maybe to ever play the game. He's certainly pushing that direction. He's, I mean, that's like crazy hyperbole, but like he's really, really special with the ball in his hands. Love, love, the, love the Hornets. Um, even if I maybe don't, don't care for the musical stylings of Gordon Hayward, uh, the magic, they're like a bad team. I'm curious to watch. Uh, I, I like, I like their collection of guards, Cole Anthony. Um, look where you look up where he went to college. Um, Jalen Suggs, uh, Marco Fultz, when he's back to see what that looks like. Mo Bamba and Wendell Carter as like giants who could play together up front. Um, yeah, I'm curious to see the magic and the Raptors because they just have a, like every single player in the Raptors is six foot eight. <laughs> and I, I want to see a team of all dudes who are six foot eight. Those are the teams I'm excited for, for sure. Next question comes from Tales from the 300 level at Tales from the 300 level on Twitter, who asks, what kind of defensive schemes do you think Portland will employ against the larger lineups within our Northwest division? Denver and Utah in particular have much larger lineups than we do. Does Denver? I mean, I know Michael Porter Jr. is really big at small forward, but he his size is like mo- mostly for like shooting from the outside. Uh, you're not going to put like, th- that's just a bummer that the Blazers don't have that size. I don't think they're going to really change it up. Also, um, like uh, Utah, I don't feel like is big at all. I, are they? Like Rudy Gobert's big, but they'll just put Nurk on him. Uh, but like they play, they play they, like their thing is that they're kind of small, right? Is like that Joe Ingles and 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 Bogdanovich are like fours in like in sort of foot speed, but maybe not in bulk, right? Right? Am I am I missing something here? This is what I need a co-host to tell me I'm missing something. Y'all know where to find me at Mike G Rich on Twitter, lockdown Blazers at gmail.com. Uh, I don't think the Blazers like they'll do scheme stuff against every team, but I don't think they're going to upsize um, too much. Like if they need to upsize, the solution is Robert Covington. Larry Nance and, and Nurkic up front and them two with Dame and CJ, that five man group, Dame, CJ, Rocco, uh, Larry Nance and Nurk is one of the most intriguing five man groups that they're going to play this year. Let's see it. I want to see it. Um, yeah, I think that's what they do against bigger teams, but I don't, I'm not sure that those two teams specifically are really big. I might be confused. I might've forgotten some players that are on these teams, but I don't, I don't, I think those teams are normal sized um, with centers. Olan Fulfer asks our next question for at Fulfero3 on Twitter, who asks, do you see the same situation for Anthony Simons this season that we had with Gary Trent Jr. last year? I could see that if he plays really well, we will have to trade him or else risk losing him to a team that might sign him to a pretty large contract we can't afford to pay out. That's not really what happened with Gary Trent Jr. The Blazers traded Gary Trent Jr. for a player who's better than Gary Trent Jr., older but better, um, and paid that player more money. Like the... Norm and, and Gary Trent got the same contract per on an annual, like on a per year basis, like per, per, per annum. Uh, but like, it, and Norm's is larger. It's just like a longer deal. Uh, so I don't think it was the money. I think it was talent. I think it was just like talent and fit. I don't think uh, the Blazers were not scared by a giant contract. They were looking to upgrade the roster and they did. Um, yeah, I, I, I think there's a situation where Ant gets traded this year because if he really pops and he can play, he's the, um, he's, uh, probably more tradable than other pieces. He's entering free agency. So it's like you're the team who's trading for Ant is actually trading for the right to pay Anthony Simons. So he really has to pay well, play well, because you want like the appealing part would be the right to pay him, right? Like that's, that's the appeal. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think I don't think the situations are necessarily comparable. But if the players have a chance to upgrade from Amphrey Simons for like a, a veteran who will end up commanding the same amount of money on the open market, yeah, do it. Like, just be as good as you possibly can around Damian Lillard while he's around. That's my advice. All right, let's come back in the third segment. Close out the show with more of your questions on this glorious mailbag Monday. But first, let me tell you about Built Bar. Built Bar is the best tasting protein bar ever. If you're me. You know what you're doing? You're you're eating you're eating two Bill Bars that are your favorite. Cookies and cream and peanut butter brownie. But they got flavors for everybody. Like new flavors like cherry lime and strawberry puff and churro puff, a popular favorite that's back for a limited time. So regardless of whatever your palate is, you're going to find something you like because all of these bars are, are taste great. They're covered in 100% chocolate. They provide you that little kick of sweetness that you might need in the middle of the day, but they also provide a punch. 17 to 18 grams of protein, 130 to 180 calories, only 4 to 5 grams of sugar, and no more than 5 grams of net carbs. 
all tasty, all healthy. Go get yourself some. Go to built.com. Use the promo code LOCKED15. You'll get 15% off your next order. That is promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. Still a pass first point guard. Still Mike Richmond. Still listening to Locked on Lasers. Let's keep it rolling with more on the special delivery mailbag. Our next question comes from Andy C., who asks, A lot of talk about the promised expanded roles for Norman Powell, Yusuf Nurkic, Anthony Simons, Nazir, and Nazir Little. How does that happen with Damon C.J.? I don't know, Andy C. I don't know. It can't. You can't. It can't. Not everyone can have more. I mean, Nazir Little can have more because he didn't play at all last year. And if he plays, that's an expanded role. But, like, Nurk can't have a 15% share of the offense if also Norman Powell gets a big share of the offense and then also Ant has the ball in his hands all the time and then you still kind of need you know 28 from Damon 23 from CJ like uh there's a balance there and and each maybe each night one of those guys you know it's Norm's night it's Nurk's night uh, not like it would be scripted that way but it's just like how the game flow would work um takes over but it just can't it can't like in the The preseason is the time to talk about the right things and say the right things and promise guys what they need to hear so everyone buys into the plan. And the regular season is to execute whatever plan helps you win the most games. I don't think it can all happen. I think one of the fascinating parts of this season is that all of these dudes expect more, but you're still going to get a baseline of sort of just like, on ball doing stuff from Damon CJ and reducing Damon CJ's roles does not make this team better. Do not kid yourself. Do not kid yourself to think less of Damon CJ is somehow a solution. Uh, The solution is if the Blazers are good enough that Damon CJ don't have to play, but playing them 30 minutes a night instead of 34 to me, doesn't get you a better team. The, the, the best case scenario is that you only have to play them 30 minutes a night because you just don't have to bring them back in and in a pinch in the fourth quarter, or you're not the worst second quarter team in the league. Like, um, you know, they're still going to want to play. They're still going to want to play. CJ has said straight up, he still wants to play his minutes. So that's, that's still a thing that he's, he's going to want to do. And you can, you can book it that they're going to play a bunch, but like, um, you know, you pencil them in for 33 to 35 minutes a night. Uh, and we're talking, maybe you reduce, try to reduce shot, like one or two shot or th- shot attempts here and there. That's the solution. But I, I don't think it can all happen. Next question comes from Hotai Kim. That's Hotai underscore Kim 97 on Twitter, who asks who will win a basketball game? Five Damian Lords or five Draymond Greens? Five Dames by a mile. I don't understand the, I don't understand the hypothetical. What Draymond Green is really, really freaking good at is, um, complimenting, skills for other players that he doesn't have if you're a shooter he finds you as a shooter if you're a if you're a lob threat like if you can roll to the rim he can throw that you throw a lob pass like he's an elite help defender like he's a he is one of the great role players that the game has ever seen but five draymonds like each each successive draymond doesn't make the previous draymond better in fact they maybe don't shoot during the game um and draymond guarding game straight up like He would be, you know, there's like crazy help defense from five Draymonds, but Dame by a mile, by a mile. You're playing like a fives to 15. I bet Dame wins like 15, six. Next question comes from Brian Henry at NJ Saint one on Twitter, who asks, are there any alternate uniforms we'll be sporting this season? That's another collective pronoun. You love to see it. Um, Yes. Blazers are going to wear two regulars, uh, one alternate. And then uh, Chris McGowan said at media day that they've got a, like, he called it like a mixtape. And then he, and then he kind of apologized for using jargon. But I think that means, well, the way he explained it was, it's going to be um, a combination of like a bunch of their elements of past jerseys. It's the 75th uh, anniversary of the NBA and the Blazers are going to like celebrate their past with elements of all of those jerseys in their quote, mixtape Jersey. Sounds cool. Might be a little busy, but it'll be cool. I, in general, when I've seen the new jerseys, I've been like, these suck. And then like, even the Brown jerseys grew on me a little bit last year. Um, so I hope whatever they do is, is like wacky because if it's only going to be around for a short time, might as well be a memorable, crazy one. Next question comes from Dave who asks, if we are to assume that this is Dame's last season in Portland, which home games are you circling this season to be at at Moda Center? 
I mean, me personally, I um, am lucky enough to have media access to games credentialed. I, uh, not, maybe not to every single game, but I'm going to be able to go to a lot, you know, 30 something of the 40 home games, 41 home games. Um, so I'm going to go to a bunch and I'm going to cherish it. And the point is like, even if this isn't Dame's last season, hold tightly to your joy. You do not know what the future holds. And if Damian Lord brings you joy, watch him as much as you can and appreciate the moments, appreciate the moment, look at it and say, this rocks. I love watching Dame. Don't fear the future. Hold tightly to your joy. Live in the present. And and if you can, reflect on the joy it brings you because that's the only way um, in in the challenges of this world to, to appreciate it um, is 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 to is when things bring you joy is to is to hold them close and remember them and maybe even say out loud, this brings me joy. That's a little bit of advice. I joy is a big part of this podcast. In fact, um, good time to bring this up. I have I have been doing blazers moment of joys um which is i've asked fans share their blazers moment of joy and i've i share them on friday shows throughout the off season i have a handful more like i have f- four or five more maybe six even um that you dear listeners have sent me i haven't forgot about them uh it's just been weird scheduling i'm gonna i'm gonna get back to them so if if you are like hey mike what is what's the deal the deals they're sitting in my inbox i got them saved and organized um when when so the schedule kind of when I'm not cramming through season previews, we'll get back to Blazers moments of joy. I, it's a great reminder of, of appreciating and loving this team and this sport. So we will share those again. If you're missing those, uh, that segment, it's coming back soon, but it might have to wait until we kind of get in the, into the rhythm of the regular season and I'll bring it back. Okay. Our next question comes from Lewis who asks, What's the logic behind the first in the last two minutes foul rule? Why should a team that has been conscientious about clean defending for the first 10 minutes of the quarter be punished with an early foray into the penalty, especially in the first three periods when intentional fouls are uncommon? In a game with way too many free throw attempts amid all the ways that have been discussed to reduce stoppages in play and keep the game moving down the stretch, I've never heard this rule discussed. I see fouls to give as an earned advantage similar to managing timeouts and see no reason for that to be taken away from diligent defense. Yeah, I like this idea for the first three quarters. Um, it seems like it could come back to bite you at the end of the game if you had been diligent and not fouling and then you needed to foul to like extend the game. Like say you're down one and you just need to foul so you can get the ball back and have one more shot, but you had to foul f- five times um, in the final, you know, s- s- say nine seconds, you're just going to lose. Um, so I think there's some advantage there at the end of the game for a sort of late game strategy. But the first three quarters, I'm with you, Lewis. I hadn't considered this. this is, you've cracked the code. This is this is a good solution. Let's get rid of the uh, two fouls in the final two minutes that immediately put you in the bonus. Uh, Lewis, good work. Next question comes from Liam at Liam Rally 25 on Twitter, who asks, what is the minimum amount of money someone would have to pay you to take a charge from everyone on the Blazers roster? Rules. They get to run from half court. Feet got to be set. And they are aware of how much money you will make from the exchange. You know, I I got two jobs. I record a daily podcast, free wherever you get podcasts, and now also on YouTube. And I got a day job. Like I don't. <laughs> it's gonna have to be a lot of money because I'm I'm doing fine, um, or not even doing fine. I just like the like a small pennies is not gonna be a motivator for me. So it's probably like eighty thousand dollars or more. Like it's like a it's going to have to be like a year, like a year's worth of work at the very, very least. So like 80 plus Uh, my gut said $200,000, but I think that's too much. Um, I ran this by a friend and they said $20,000 and I think that's too little. And they were trying to convince me that $20,000 is a lot of money. And it is like, I'll take it. But, um, I don't know. I'm going to get trucked. I'm not that big. Like that's going to hurt. Yusuf Nurk is just like seven foot, 300 pounds. And he's, um, I don't know if he loves the media. <laughs> In fact, I, I'm pretty certain he doesn't care for it. So I don't want to get trucked by Nurk. I'm gonna need. I'm gonna need 80k. I'm gonna need 80k at a minute. Our final question of the show, a fun one from Alex King at Alex J King 35 on Twitter, who says, "Compare each blazer to food. Like Dame could be lobster, and Kelja Blevins is a McNugget." Okay, I've done it. So let's start with Dame as lobster. Let's just make that our jumping off point. Damon Lord is a lobster. He is decadent. Um, he is, uh, you know, a, a sign of, of um, you know, that it's your high class stuff. He is a treat. Damon Lord is absolutely a treat. He is not everyday food. CJ McCollum is crab. Because if you got lobster, you don't really need crab. 
It's delicious in its own right, but you don't need them both. You kind of need lobster or crab. You don't need both lobster and crab. You don't need it. You don't need it's overkill. Um, you don't need two shelled animals that have, you know, at least relatively similar a lot of overlap in the way you eat them, the way you enjoy them, and all that they do. You don't need crab and lobster. It's fine if you have them. You're gonna have a great seafood, you're gonna have a great time cracking into that seafood, but y'all know the score of the game. Norm Powell shrimp. A better pairing with lobster and a better pairing with crab. <laughs> Maybe if you had each of them on their own, Norm Powell has a shrimp would make sense to both and make sense next to both of them. Uh, and on his own, he's, you know, uh, also, also somewhat of an indulgent food with some, uh, you know, you don't have, you don't have shrimp a million different ways, but it has enough versatility that you can really appreciate it. Robert Covington is potatoes. I was going to go French fries, but Robert Covington's more versatile than that. He can be mashed potatoes, curly fries, tater tots, waffle fries. He is potatoes. Never the star, but an elite, an elite complimentary part. It can, potatoes can complement nearly any dish. They can be served a million different ways. They do so many valuable things, but never a star. Robert Covington is potatoes. Yusuf Nurkic is a cheeseburger, or just a, a burger if you're if you're not eating dairy this week, um, because burgers are dependable, delicious, and a staple. And when they're done right, they're incredible. A reminder of just sort of the how important and anchoring an Americana classic can be. But when you have a crappy burger, man, is it a disappointment? You go to a bar and you pay like $19, $22 for a burger and a beer and it stinks. It stinks. It can ruin a night. An, uh, an inconsistent, a burger that isn't, doesn't meet your expectations is a bummer. And a, but a burger can be that sort of perfect food. You're like, darn, that was a good burger. It's so dependable. When it's good, it's good. And when it's bad, it's a bummer. Use of Nurkic is a burger. Every Simons is Beef Wellington. I've been hearing about how fancy Beef Wellington is forever. And there's kind of a, there's just, it's a very involved dish. Puff pastry and some uh, uh, mushroom kind of little gravy thing in there. And then, and then this uh, you know, medium rare cooked steak. And people are saying this is fancy and this is a delight. But to me, maybe this is really good. But the hype and the name and the presentation have taken away from it to some extent. If someone just served me a delicious steak and some uh, and some mushrooms on the side and said, this kicks ass, I would say, yeah, I, I'm into it. Beef Wellington, hurt by the name. Anthony Simons, perhaps damaged by being called the chosen one two years ago. Larry Nance Jr. is cauliflower. He's new to the game. He's new to the team, but he's got real versatility. In fact, he can sub in for a lot of what potatoes do, but you don't have to serve them like potatoes. You can fry them. Uh, you can pickle them. You can, serve them. you can serve them hot. You can serve them cold. You can roast them. You can mash them up. Uh, cauliflower has real versatility. You can make it into pizza crust. This is real dependable. Again, not, not very unlikely to be the star of the show, but real versatility. Larry Nance's cauliflower. Cody Zeller is PB and J. Not gonna knock your socks off. In fact, sometimes you're gonna be a little bit disappointed to open up your lunch and be like, PB and J, huh? All right. But it, it gets the job done. It's dependable, tried and true. Uh, you're not gonna brag about a PB and J. You're not gonna say, today I got a PB and J with me, or I'm gonna go home and make a PB and J. You're not gonna brag about it. You're going to appreciate its classicness. You're going to appreciate its utilitarian, uh, you know, a little bit of sweet, a little bit of salty. It's PB&J's work, and they work for a reason because you know they're all right. Nazir Little is Tadig, the Persian rice dish. Very popular on the internet. I see a lot of people making Tadig, Tadig but I never had it. <laughs> I know a lot about it. It's you know at its best it's um it's got a lot of turmeric and it's it's crispy on the bottom and you can flip it over and you kind of crack it and it looks super fun it looks like incredibly fun this is something I've seen like on Instagram um you know so social uh, ex, uh, you know excited on the social me media people are for this dish but I haven't had it in my real life. I'm excited to see if it's as good as I think it might be. I'm excited to see if it lives up to the hype of social media because I, I think it probably is delicious. 
but I don't know yet. Ben McLemore's a side salad. It's fine. Probably don't need him. Got a baked potato. But yeah, I'm cool. <laughs> side salad. Thanks a lot. I'm happy, I'm happy to have it. This will work out great. If I need some vegetables, if I need a shooter, side salad will be just, just what I ordered. Appreciate it. Tony Snell is broccoli. Not a lot of wasted calories. It's got uh, does enough, enough stuff that you can depend on it. But in the end, it's just broccoli. It's a it's a vegetable that you know. This is a this is a no empty calorie, a lot of nutrition. Um, you know, <laughs> it's somebody who shoots 50% from three, but isn't gonna wow you in many other ways. CJ Ellaby is a Seattle dog. Comes from the Pacific Northwest, and I don't really know what the deal is. Why is there cream cheese on it? Why, who is, what's CJ Ellaby doing? Um, I know he's a second round pick, and I'm not trying to bag on him. Like, I'm teasing everybody here. That's kind of the point of these, uh, of these exercises is to be a little, to get some jokes off. But, like, listen, I don't know why they're putting uh, cream cheese on. <laughs> I don't know why they're putting cream cheese on those hot dogs in Seattle. And I don't really get the deal with uh, CJ Ellaby being on the back after this roster because the Blazers could use a taller person or another, um, just some more useful depth in the back half of this, uh, back half of this group. Greg Brown the third is a Twinkie. Some empty calories, a lot of flash. And I don't really want a Twinkie quite frankly. But when I do, there is nothing like it. That is Greg Brown Jr. dunking between his legs, where it's like, do we really need this this sort of hollow, empty calories? But then it happens, you're like, damn, that's good. That is, uh, th that is just truly indulgent and wonderful. Greg Brown is a Winky. That's everybody on, that's everyone but not the two-way guys. I don't really know what Trendon Watford is. Uh, Trenda Watford is Trenda Watford will have to graduate into me knowing about him. And as Alex said, Keldon Blevins is a McNugget. Um, that that might be a little higher praise than I'm giving Blevins because a ch uh, chicken McNugget is an American classic. Um, that's it. That's it for mailbag. Uh, we will have we do this each week. If you want to get involved, at Mike G. Rich on Twitter or locked on blazerspod at gmail.com. We got more shows coming this week. The Blazers play Wednesday afternoon against Phoenix. We will have talk about what happens in that game. Uh, hoping to lock down a interview for Friday's show. So be on the lookout for that one. And Friday's show, an interview here in this space. We're going to try to do interviews each week, um, schedule permitting. This sh Listen, Locked on Blazers comes five days a week. Um, the way it works is I think one day a week will make sense for us to get an interview in here, get another, get people who are around the team, get other opinions, get people from other, other markets in here to sort of talk about, um, you know, talk about what they've seen, make this a dialogue. I want this show to have real variety. That's why we do mailbags. That's why we do, uh, you know, the segments that we do. So yeah, look for Friday's show. Um, like I'm saying, I'm efforting this is all I'm I'm kind of saying all this to say. I'm efforting this because I, I want to make the show great and I want you to enjoy it. I also want you to subscribe to the YouTube channel, uh a thousand by Halloween. We're pushing up towards six hundred. Uh get in while you can and say, I was there in the first six hundred. Uh, and that way when we do hit a thousand by Halloween, you can brag to your friends. It's also available wherever you get podcasts. So if your friends are asking, Hey, Blazer season about to start. Do you listen to any podcasts? Tell them you listen to lockdown blazers and tell them it's available wherever they get podcasts and on YouTube. All right. That's going to do it. Appreciate you listening. Talk to you soon. Yeah.